So, good evening to everyone and welcome to London Maths AAD sessions. My name is Beatrice De Carli. I'm a senior lecturer in urban design at London Met and the deputy director of the Center for Urban and Built Ecologies that hosts this session. The focus of the session today, as you know, is on the commons and more specifically, we'll be talking about urban and cultural commons. We'll talk about how the commons are conceived and practiced and what an engagement with the commons might mean for us as designers and creative practitioners and researchers. The session will include two presentations. We will have a presentation by the Urban Commons Research Group, which is largely based at the University of Sheffield, which will discuss uh, there how our handbook for the Urban Commons. And then our own Tarantia Consari will talk about designing the cultural commons. Each presentation is meant to last for about 20 minutes. We'll uh, go through the two presentations back to back and then uh, have time for discussion afterwards. So to introduce uh, our speakers, the Urban Commons Research Group is a collective of scholars that uh, might be situated at various intersections between research practice and activism, and who have been gathering for the last few years together with the aim to expand and deepen understanding of the urban commons and of their potential to democratize access to urban resources through sharing and through collaboration. The group formed in 2018 at the School of Architecture of the University of Sheffield and includes Alex Axinte, Anna Mendes de Andes, Professor Dina Petrescu, Dr. Eleni Caterini, Emma Bill, Ezra Khan, Katharina Mebus, Melissa Harrison, Thomas Moore, Dr. Julia Udall, and myself. And so I won't be able to give you details of all of these people, but you'll meet most of them during the evening and they will be presenting part of the work. So during the session, we as a group will present the outcome in progress uh, of our collaboration, the Handbook for Urban Commons. And the handbook explores the notion of urban commons and a range of common in experiments in relation to different thematic focuses that will be explained later in the evening. Following that presentation, uh, Taranja Konsari will talk about designing the cultural commons. Tarange, many of you will know her, is a co-founder and director of the Urbanism, Public Art and Architecture Practice, Public Works. Her projects focus on, focus on public space, working with local organizations, communities, government bodies and stakeholders. In 2018, she wrote a postgraduate course called Design for Cultural Commons that sits within London Metropolitan University as a, a sort of transdisciplinary course. Her talk this evening will articulate the importance of cultural commons in a struggle for land in neighborhoods and will then put forward three design forms in the construction of the commons, design interventions, events design and design in disobedience. So I won't take you much uh, longer of your time. Thank you very much to everyone for joining. And I think we might start uh, now give the floor to Professor okay. Dina Petrescu which will introduce the handbook for the culture, for the commons, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Bea, can you please share the screen maybe? Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for this introduction and for the, uh, the opportunity to present our work in progress uh, to such an interesting, um, uh, gathering. Um, I'm, I'm sure there will be very fruitful discussion. Um, so uh, oh. we uh, we know that for a long time the commons have been regarded as a way to generate social processes, able to maintain, uh, reproduce and reinvent our lives in times of uncertainty. And the contemporary hypothesis of the commons offer in these times of crisis uh, a political project, uh, perhaps a concrete governance model of collective uh, um, resource uh, management and uh, a potential form of social organization. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, according to different uh, theorists, uh, the three elements that compose the commons are um, a pool of uh, resources, uh, a community uh, that uses these resources in common and a bunch of collectively agreed rules for governance uh, or what some call 
commoning processes. Um, you know, principles of the commons are uh, universality, democracy, sustainability, and in, in, uh, inalienability. I won't go into detail with explaining this because it would take too long. But let's come to urban commons. Uh, and, uh, you know, as the urban is a mix of the material, uh, the built environment and the immaterial, the social relations, the uh, political and uh, uh, economic relations and so on, uh, the urban commons uh, share some of, of the, the aspects of these two. Uh, they can be inherited, um, you know, like the traditional commons. There are still uh, urban commons that are traditional commons or constructed uh, like uh, many of the new commons. Uh, and the way of studying them necessitates a mix of empirical and speculative methods um, to capture somehow the modes of production and reproduction of these uh, material and immaterial aspects. Um, you know, things like knowledge, socialities, economies. Um, and uh, the why now, <laughs> why, why urban commons uh, would be of interest? Because that they offer a relevant proposal in relation to our capacity of social uh, reproduction and ecological repair when this capacity is in crisis, uh, as it is the case today, with uh, issues of climate change, for example, but you know uh, other things as well, or is under political and economic threat, uh, being exposed to processes of extraction or enclosure, uh, as, uh, as we can witness a lot um, today, as, again, so com commons serve also as a frame to understand these processes uh, and to propose a new imaginary of what uh, would help us to organize our lives together based on collaboration, uh, cooperation, and, and transversality. So uh, these were somehow the principles that uh, we adopted when we decided to work together uh, on this subject as a self-constituted group of uh, researchers, um, you know, doing research at all levels, inside and outside the University of Sheffield, uh, and based somehow on relations of affinity and friendship. Maybe, uh, Bea, can you pass to the next slide, please? Okay. Uh, being concerned with the practice-based research mainly and uh, activist research and involving uh, also most of the time our own practices uh, and networks uh, as, as co-producers. Um, maybe um, the research took the form of seminars, of presentations, of workshops, uh, with uh, a main output uh, at the end, which is a small handbook that uh, we, we hope can be useful, um, become a useful resource for students and practitioners mainly uh, interested in uh, interested in these issues. Uh, can we go to the next, please? So this is a diagram that uh, Anna did uh, to present the group where you can see this uh, constellation of, uh, of networks and of, um, uh, of um, you know, collaborative relations between people that were inside in the University of Sheffield, people that uh, left, uh, like, um, like Bea and uh, Fabio, uh, people that are also connected to different um, uh, practices uh, as we will um, uh, present further. So uh, Anna, I think, will speak a little bit more about the process. Anna? Yeah, the, yes. the idea of the handbook started first, as Diana said, to propose like concrete uh, theoretical frames and practices that could help us to understand what is at stake with this idea of the commons. So from the beginning, we decided to focus not from an, let's say, urban and architectural point of view on functions of the city, but of certain kind of what we now call strands issues that we thought were uh, relevant to understand what was going on. And we started with this idea of organizing also practices, references, projects that we knew, that we have been working with. Uh, and the idea was not to create, let's say, a very exhaustive 
uh, list of references, but more to look at the ones that we thought could help us to understand better this issue. Next. So um, this is our first attempt to take this, uh, you know, like data collection of the projects, the text, and the practices. We also struggle, you know, with this idea of what is the practice, what is a project, what is the limit between, you know, a group of people that does a systematic work on something from a project, and um, and we try also to place it uh, in relation with these concepts and and these strands that we were working next um, one event that we did and at central san martins actually had also the idea of gathering this kind of um, references and also seeing what other people actually had what what were their imaginaries as well when we uh, speak about the urban commons specifically what are the kind of uh, images or projects that came to their minds um, and how this had like some points of similarity, but also different from our own uh, stance, that then we thought we should then explain no? and make a very um, obvious uh, a statement of what is the place that, that we have in the urban commons, like basically how we understand them. Next. Um, we also have had the, the, the pleasure and the honor to share discussions with uh, incredible pr practitioners and theoreticians, and uh, Torrance one of, being one of them, uh, that were also somehow related to the University of Came for different reasons. We had a very interesting session with Catherine Gibson, but also Habu Hendel, uh, one of the uh, practices you will see that uh, comes from her from her office or the project I am part of that works on common codes uh, in Spain. Next. Um, so fast forward almost two years <laughs> and one pandemic, and uh, we are now in the point of finishing all the texts and then trying, and I really like this process of reweaving and tracing and, you know, like uh, making this, this complex, you know, uh, ecosystem of concepts and, and practices, knitting them together through this idea of the reference and the tax. And these images was just uh, to make uh, this impression that although we are having these seven different strands, they are somehow, there are issues that go through them and there are concepts that resonate. And there is also our collective work because we have done a process through which um, each of the tests have been reviewed by someone else and commented, sometimes more than two persons, so, so that the final input is actually uh, truly collective thinking put in words. Next. Now we are going to explain the strands that are, maybe not explain in this order, <laughs> dealing with the issue of Infrastructures, ecologies, localities, knowledge, economies, socialities, and governance. So, next. Infrastructures. So, the strand moves beyond infrastructure, commonly understood as physical and organizational structures and systems, such as streets, railways, water pipes, etc towards Lauren Ballant's characterization of commons as transformational infrastructures for troubling troubled times, facilitating not only repair of glitches in the reproduction of everyday life, but modes of transitioning through and beyond crisis towards new ways of world building and care. We also signal a move from infrastructure as a noun to infrastructuring as a verb, as a relational process that opens spaces and times of possibility and catalyzes mutual agency through an ethics of care and negotiation. Um, next slide, please. And the story or case study that's explored is La Foresta, a community academy and a local train station, which was initiated in 2017 by Brave New Outs and others in collaboration with the municipality of Rovereto in Italy. 
And the group actually contacted the Italian railways to inquire if they could utilize a vacant space at the main train station for three years and without any rental payment in order to experiment with the culture and social activities that they had in mind. And much to their surprise, the proposal was accepted. Amidst the, the Academy's activities, it's also engendered various other initiatives, such as a community drinks project, a traveling bread oven, a forest kindergarten, a cinema group, and a refugee support group. Ecology is um, it's another strand. Uh, in, in fact, uh, each strand is organized uh, in uh, one uh, theoretical part and uh, a case study, uh, which is very much related to, um, you know, a case study that we have researched or we know or we are practicing. <laughs> so uh, in terms of ecologies, we thought that, uh, um, you know, urban commons can contribute to uh, to social and ecological repair because they are built on relation of collective care on regeneration and resilience and uh, and they can provide an alternative to the extractive and exploitative er relations uh, uh, of the uh, capitalism and we also use the term eco commoning um, to highlight the multiple ecological implications and benefits of uh, any commoning transaction, not only urban commoning transaction, that are related to live words uh, at any, any scale. And uh, some of the questions that maybe the urban commons are rising are how can these ecological benefits uh, uh, be scaled up and how can they be sustained in time and what is the role of designers in supporting eco commoning. Uh, next, uh, and to exemplify somehow and to answer this question, uh, we took the um, uh, the case of uh, Rurban, which I am involved in, and uh, Torange is also involved in because it is. Uh, a, a collective project um, uh, which puts forward uh, this idea of um, uh, a strategy of common space uh, resilience, urban common space resilience, uh, uh, made of um, networks of uh, um, civic hubs that are managed by citizens and which are located in uh, uh, mostly the, the private neighborhoods, um, uh, suburban neighborhoods. And this is an image from uh, from Colombe, which is a, a neighborhood, um, which is a, a suburban city uh, at the northwest of Paris. But there were two hubs also uh, in London. And now there are uh, uh, almost 10 hubs that have been built um, in, uh, in the Parisian region and in London, uh, in metropolitan London. Uh, this is one urban agriculture hub, uh, which is called uh, Agrocité, that has a very interesting history that we are uh, uh, we are commenting on uh, in uh, in the handbook. Thanks. Yes, the localities uh, strand. Uh, the localities strand uh, focuses on the values created uh, within and from below while making visible the broader power relations that surround urban commoning. Uh, we approach the local scale with uh, awareness of the colonial legacy that continue to inform processes of uh, othering, enclosure, extraction, that uh, perpetuate social inequality and uneven distribution of resources and uh, opportunities. Our focus on localities highlights pluralism, local autonomy and interdependence. And we ask, how can the urban commons provide us with shared positionings, concepts and practices that challenge authoritar authoritarianism? The Strand emphasizes the need to make visible localized stories of commoning and the specific cultures and practices of sharing that inform them. At the same time, it highlights the potential in bringing these stories together, building translocal networks of solidarity around urban commons, 
there are inspiring practices of knowledge sharing and uh, mutual learning happening across uh, localities, such as Economodic School connecting practices and projects across countries within Europe, or Itinerant Schools, a pedagogical initiative of uh, landless workers' movements in Brazil that weave together the experiences of uh, commoning and uh, common spaces. Next, please. Uh, to learn from localized stories of commoning, the handbook presents the stories, story of Hands-On Famagusta project as to, told together with the members of the project team, which might be in this uh, call as well. I know Emre and me are uh, part of it too. Uh, the project is grounded in the urban contestations of the divided territory of Cyprus and advocates for urban commons to activate alternative processes for imagining the future of the cities in this context. Uh, the image on the screen is a provocative counter mapping of Famagusta city represented with its urban enclaves. Uh, urban commons uh, provided for the project the framework and the vocabulary to suggest speculative scenarios of commoning that could act across these fragments as uh, unifying elements. Okay, uh, so knowledge is um, from an uh, urban commons perspective, uh, the understanding uh, and operation of knowledge can be uh, twofold uh, in support of uh, the commoning process and as a resource, uh, a common resource in itself. So. Um, this kind of two instances, knowledge for commoning, which can represent the protocols, the format and the practices that are acquired, instituted and shared to support and maintain the urban commons uh, as a collective process. And on the other hand, knowledge as commons, which are formed where protocols uh, um, of the production process and it, its outcomes becomes a resource to be shared and collectively governed uh, in the commoning process. So uh, a few examples like knowledges for commoning can cover either practical aspects, uh, like for instance acquiring composting skills that can be transferred throughout the community, or more institutional capacities like uh, civic labs, which uh, um, appearing recently and are empowering citizens to navigate and act in the legal institutional landscape or uh, uh, examples of knowledge is as commons. Um, one example, of course, is knowledge sharing infrastructures like Wikipedia, but also uh, at the local scale, uh, this sort of citizen science, which has uh, gained increased at, um, attention. So um, in this kind of uh, uh, illustrates, uh, il attempt to illustrate this uh, uh, knowledge production in re relation with the world. Um, uh, we choose the city school project, which is the next slide, um, which is a project uh, uh, coordinated by Studio Basar practice, which I was part of uh, in Bucharest, Romania. And city school was uh, designed as an interdisciplinary laboratory uh, where students and inhabitants meet and collaborate in the framework of a specific topic, in this case, uh, the topic was the, the uh, public libraries in the context of collective housing in the uh, specific to the eastern uh, uh, part of Europe. Um, and this is uh, knowledge. Yeah, hi. So um, the economy strands um, kind of follows uh, the process of uh, enclosure, uh, which kind of started in the uh, 15th and 16th centuries, um, uh, particularly in England, and but in, in medieval Europe, but then kind of follows the development of enclosure um, right through to the to the modern day, where um, not only is it a, a way of um, kind of private and um, governing bodies taking ownership of land, but more kind of subtly um, in terms of what's called uh, enclosure 2.0 or even 3.0 of, of kind of capturing the, the social processes of commons for uh, kind of private gain. Um, and looking at um, in particular um, ways that kind of invisible labours and reproductive labours um, have been kind of made 
uh, made visible by, for example, uh, Gibson Graham's uh, theory of, of diverse economies, um, which kind of challenges this idea of a of a, a binary relationship between um, um, kind of market and non-market, um, uh, and, and tries to kind of proliferate the many forms of of, of labour, you know, from reproductive labour to to monetary labour to um, to voluntary labour to acts of, to acts of care um, amongst commoners, um, and through doing this, it kind of illuminates uh, alternative forms of value. Um, so not only talking about the the monetary value of commons, but also talking about um, the relational value, the um, the the volunteer value, um, moving beyond that. Um, and but this is kind of uh, constantly kind of being challenged and met with kind of limitations, um, particularly by um, by the state and the market. Um, so the strand kind of answer uh, tries to ask this question of how can um, you know, urban commons economies and diverse economies kind of continually challenge those moments of, of enclosure um, and find these alternative forms of value. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the story that we're looking at in the economy stranding is, uh, is Portland Works. Um, and this is really a story of a, a, a post-industrial or an ex-industrial building um, in Sheffield, which has, you know, since the the Industrial Revolution and uh, the kind of decline of in industry in, in the 1990s has has been um, in the kind of constant battle to to uh, to I guess be valued as as a place of, of relations, as, as a place of as a, as a place of work, and it, and it tells a story of um, how um, you know. The, the uh, artists, the designers, the the makers, uh, the steel workers who still work there to this day have gone through a process of um, uh, representing and making sure that the the alternative values and the alternative forms of labour that were going on with the building were represented uh, to the local planning department in order to um, kind of rescue the building from enclosure and capture by the market, as it were. Yes, so the uh, sociality strand is concerned with cooperating social groups and their capacities to maintain, reproduce and transform the city through commoning practices. Uh, in this strand, we argue that urban commons are spaces of resistance for communities to emerge as alternative socialities. Uh, and these are spaces where a community of commoners produce material conditions of prefiguring new social systems that supports transitioning to non-racist, feminist, decolonial, post-capitalist futures. So the city is reimagined as a resourceful setting for social cooperation, coexistence, reconciliation and mutualization. And through reclaiming this resourcefulness, urban commons offers a way out of this crisis of social reproduction that we are increasingly facing today uh, due to ongoing extraction of affective, mental, cultural, material and environmental resources as a result of colonial, modern and capitalist structures. So uh, these common resources are used by community of commoners for maintaining, repairing and reinventing structures of social and ecological interdependence. Uh, by instituting practices of interdependence and conviviality, uh, urban commons contest the colonial structures, categorizing differences into conflicting territories of race, ethnicity, gender and class, and common processes enable socialities that resist othering imposed by colonial modern capitalist systems and create alternative practices to which differences across intersections of race, gender and class are, are mutualized. Um, next slide, please. And that is why we choose to tell the story of uh, Intersectionalist Stadthouse in Vienna to explore critical questions such as how can common practices support emerging socialities and enable them to become intersectional communities which go beyond the limits of capitalist subjectification? 
what would a coalition of mixed able anti-racist cross people refugee and queer people form as a community of commoners look like how can such communities remain open to others in the city even when situated in the private domain of housing what are the political and institutional tools that will allow intersectional communities to expand within the urban environment transversing their insular existences and enabling them to share their vulnerabilities with with others and the story looks into the practices of an intersectional community of queer metal worker artists and mixable subjects and the architectural support by Gabo Heindel uh, for removing mental social economic material and other barriers in the housing environment of Vienna in Otakrin, a historic working class neighborhood which have became an arrival city for marginalized populations and that is socialities well governance is um one of these three elements that Dina said that uh, configure the the commons and as such um it is maybe um not it's it's a strand of of a different weight i think in 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 the comments um but I, what i think is interesting on how on we our approach to governance is to say to anchor it in the political project of the commons and the potential to actually become a way to organize society as a whole not to take the small scale of the historical or contemporary uh, pro, uh, examples of the commons, but uh, to look at what are the mechanisms, almost like the infrastructure of the commons, what are the codes, the rules, the norms, the protocols, that uh, it's not only that we are identifying how they happen in existing examples, but actually what are the general principles that will allow us to apply it in other situations and in other in, in in other territories to foster new communities to actually manage new kind of resources so by looking at the governance as from this point of view we enlarge the imaginary of where the urban commons are happening beyond the usual examples of uh, social centers and, and community gardening and we are interested especially in the capacity of instituting of creating institutions around this emerging commons in in the city as most of the commons that we that have a, a let's say longer tradition of studies like traditional commons or digital commons actually are taking forms of resources that are pre-existing or accessible while urban commons are emerging forms that are in conflict and that very often they have to create and recreate the resources, the communities and the forms of governance. In a speed of this, next. Actually, one of the most interesting examples that we know about new forms of governance is a classical uh, self-managed uh, social center in Naples called Lasilo, Lasilo Filangieri comes from the occupation of a building that was going to be the headquarters of the uh, forum of the cultures in, in Naples, and it was turned into a collective resources. What this is, it is interesting in this case are two things. One is they had from the beginning the intention of not reclaiming these resources for a new kind of community but to reclaim it as a common that is common and protected by the public. So it enters on this idea of how the public resources actually can become common. And so it ascribes to certain kind of uh, public uh, law and not private law, for example, among uh, other consequences. Uh, what is also very interesting of this specific example is that also puts in question the somehow classical division between a certain kind of consideration of the commons from a political point of view that considers them 
from the point of view of the governance and then in relation with the city creates quite abstract ideas of the city as a commons or of the city as the place where the commons happen in a not very you know like precise way and reclaimed that the day-to-day -day administration is not only the place with certain kind of more economically based theory of the commons is produced but also political art and uh, as you will see eventually and the text they really uh, say if if we are not practicing the commons if people cannot practice the commons with us how are they going to understand the concept and i think this is a, a very strong position that they are able to articulate with the you know all the sophistication of the italian uh, thinking So currently we are, are finding the handbook's text and preparing them for publication. And uh, what we're doing with the publication is to emphasize these different trends and themes, as well as the connections across them. As Anna mentioned earlier, we've been working recently, particularly on how do we wave together these different ways of thinking and, and what concepts and uh, ideas, but also practices sort of link across them. And generally, we feel that this project is, uh, or we hope that this project will contribute to a conversation on what the commons mean in an urban context. And uh, Diana highlighted this in the beginning, what is specific about the commons in relation to urbanity. And we feel that urban commons have a much more porous definition than traditional uh, commons located in rural contexts. And through this handbook, we try to capture the complexity of uh, what it means to look at the commons within the urban setting. So in this sense, the handbook is hoping to contribute to a reflection on how the density of an urban area or the proximity of its inhabitants and the diversity of users interact with the sharing of tangible and intangible resources. And to explore this theme, we have used these trends and, and topics of the handbook as a uh, what, I, what I feel maybe a tool for thinking. So it's a uh, this division, this organization into strands, uh, as again we highlighted in the beginning, is not conclusive, and it's been a, a way that allows us to link theory and practice, and 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 to make these back and forth movements between the two. So we've been writing the stories and definitions at the same time, and in dialogue with each other, because we consider stories as a, and experiences uh, of commoning as generative of theory as much as theory helped us to read these stories and to understand uh, their significance. Uh, also, this handbook uh, is something that we see very much as a situated project. It's been produced, uh, it's, it's the outcome of our own geographical positioning and the, of this particular moment in uh, also in our own thinking and in our own uh, discussions. And for these reasons, we also see it very much as an open-ended uh, tool and, and sort of an open-ended instrument that uh, might accumulate and might be open in the future to uh, other concepts, to add in other stories. And in that sense, we hope that the next steps in this project may be making this handbook really a platform that can become plural and can be modified by others as well. So in, in that sense, we look at this as a tool that can also be projected out and passed on uh, to other hands. And the, the audience in that sense of the handbook has also been very much, we started this project with having in mind our own students and, and practitioners who might be approaching the topic and, and sort of thinking about these trends as a way of uh, allowing a, a way in and, and trying to uh, support ourselves and others in, in getting a way into the, the theme. I think we'll close on this. And apologies to Angie, we took a bit longer <laughs> than expected. It's always difficult to uh, orchestrate so many voices. But we'll, I'll give the floor to you now for the presentation. OK, thank you. Um, amazing stuff. Um, I'm so honoured to be asked in this circle. So thank you so much. This, you know, I know a lot of you very well and um, and there's a lot of um, synergies and probably similarities in some of the things I um, I also say, which is always good news because it means that <laughs> there is parity in how we're thinking about the commons. So um, without further ado, I hope I can share. I'm just going to... Um, 
gosh, this is where I hope this is the right one. God. Uh, can you see this? Because I can't see anyone. Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, okay, I'll try and not take too long so we have time for discussion. So, um, so there was a lot of discussion when I started um, to, to call my research cultural commons and also the course. Um, and there were two reasons, really. The, the conceptual one I talk about in one second, uh, but actually the, the, uh, the com comradeship one was really that I was aware that Sheffield and Doina were doing urban commons as research. And I thought it's really important and collegiate that we don't replicate or compete, but actually we, there's so much to develop in the commons that we develop quite different strands and then come together uh, and develop this discourse uh, further. So, so I was quite adamant that it should not be called urban commons. Um, but the other thing, the conceptual idea behind it, partly my interest in the interdisciplinarity, but partly I came across this concept through my research, uh, which is, you know, a lot of you might know it, uh, but as architects uh, or designers or even artists, we don't really know about it. It's a sociological concept called socialization. And it's really the process of learning um, how we behave, what values we hold, what beliefs we have and what become norm through our everyday experience and everyday activities, whether it's in the city, whether it's in our schools, whether it's with our peers, religion, media and so on. And that all builds um, what we um, what we begin to kind of um, get behind if you like and if we're talking about the commons which are so much about a systemic change then this is such an important idea to be aware of because this is what you're up against especially in a neoliberal context um, where neoliberalism capitalism and markets have become norms and uh, value systems so how do you start to think about that within that context. It is about a cultural shift. It is about a cultural change. This is really crass <laughs> in terms of what culture is, um, just so that we can have it really easily digestible. But if we take a really, really basic idea of culture, a lot of literature, you can kind of narrow it down, especially in sociological terms, into two, two main uh, um, areas. One which is the material culture of things, which is objects, and they can have meaning, agency and values. So when we're talking about, so I always struggled with this idea of resources in the commons in terms of what does that really mean for us. And so um, I'll talk about that uh, in a minute, but um, I kind of quite like the idea of cultural things or, or what I call later as common goods. Uh, as these cultural things. And then there were ideas that's more um, non-material cultures, such as things which become symbolic, things that we value, education, events, beliefs, norms, you know, all of that stuff. And I'm not going to talk about cultural traits right now, but but that as a, as a plethora of things, uh, as, as cultural um, makers, uh, in a way, they became quite important and uh, Doina touched on the new commons and the traditional commons. So I'm obviously within cultural commons, they are new commons. New commons are man-made. Uh, they're not uh, planet like they're not fisheries or forests and tr what, what are called tra traditional commons. And these are just a list of new commons that Charlotte Hess uh, in 2009 uh, mapped and listed as what was emerging as the new commons. Um, and I obviously will mainly talk about cultural commons, but, um, but my research um, also starts to address uh, the neighborhood commons, uh, knowledge commons and the civic commons, but I won't talk about that so much. And I think that would be a really interesting conversation to, for us to continue in terms of the difference between urban and neighborhood commons, but I won't talk about that right now. 
So what the new commons produce, um, they produce common good. And I, I really much prefer the idea of common good than resources. First of all, because common good um, is actually such a deep, um, deep kind of theoretical concept, but also a deep idea um, that comes, you know, it goes as far back as Aristotle. So, um, so, so, so if we talk about production of common good, um, I also really quite enjoy the idea that methods of engagement and participation and co-production is th thought through or framed through events. Um, and uh, because then they become cultural again, they can become performative, they can have narratives uh, and so on. And it, and it moves it out of the statutory community engagement uh, consultation kind of arena. Um, as, as was said earlier, they produce social and political communities which are so vital uh, in this neoliberal context um, as kind of vehicles for us to be resisting and fighting enclosures. Um, it's something I call uh, beautiful organizational forms, which goes back to the governance that Anna was talking about. Um, but in the arts, um, again, there's, a, there's some literature, it's very limited, but there is some literature on organizational aesthetic. So I became quite interested in the idea of shifting aesthetic away from objects and products and uh, art pieces um, to forms of organization which are uh, predominantly social. Uh, they create collaborative empowering governance structures, they create common space that flattens hierarchies, ethics of care that was talked about earlier, uh, which again is quite little in the, um, in the literature about the commons. Um, and uh, carefully designing what we produce, how we produce it, um, and how much of it. And that is kind of really important, whether you're an artist, you're a designer, or you're an architect or an urbanist. Um, it's really important to understand that commons are not open to, to all. They are a finite community with borders and boundaries. Um, so they are not about a crowd, and that gets quite confused all the time in terms of what's a kind of public good, crowd, big, and what's common and finite. Um, and I can talk about that a bit later as well. So cultural commons, um, I, I suppose it's more that um, we produce material things as cultural practitioners, whether we're architects, designers, or artists. And so we need to kind of really be on top of what those material things are and what we are actually contributing to in the cultures that we we cultures that we create uh, in the world out there and so um and there's this kind of unbalance um kate roworth in her book donut economics talks which i really enjoy talks about not that the commons should replace the markets um, or the public sector, but that they are part of a balancing ecosystem of goods, uh, private, pl public and common. And I thought that's kind of really interesting and sat with me much nicer than this kind of power relationship between one replacing the other, which I find slightly patriarchal as well. Um, they're critical and reflexive um, and they enable us as forms of practice to design new kind of uh, organizations, institutions, um, and so on. Um, this is just, um, you know, my review of the literature, uh, which kind of up to 2019 was that uh, in the literature, there's kind of extensive work which is done on cultural commons uh, around intellectual property. Um, open source, but I'm not quite sure if they are commons. I think that's where I, this kind of weird blurring happens between the, the kind of open public and the commons. Uh, knowledge commons, there's a lot around that. Cultural heritage, cultural organizations and artistic collectives and peer-to-peer -peer production. Um, but there's still quite a lot for us to, to do around the cultural commons. Um, so this is what I was talking about, that if we start to, uh, James Gilligan, 
uh, starts to uh, advocate that we should start to separate common good and public good and start to distinguish the difference between them. And that the common good is produced from the bottom up. It's created for a defined community because in that defined, when you have a defined community, that's where you start to build trust relationships. That's where you start to build respect. That's you, you start to build conviviality and social relationships. Whereas you can't do that in a universal abstract crowd, which is the public good. And the public good is kind of thought about as more uh, where it should be that the public sector is stewarding it and protecting it for, for the wider public, for us as a crowd society. And, um, and what I was talking about in terms of the common good is the, and the and production of political communities through production of common good as practices is that these communities can then start to also um, make um, make the public sector accountable for the production of our public good. So they are really necessary and at the moment they are so weak in terms of the commons and the community if you like and precarious that we don't have the capacity to actually keep the public accountable and actually keep the private accountable. There's no accountability in the UK at the moment for the private sector. The Office for um, Public Scrutiny has no authority over private sector, which I think is, is shocking, really. So if we marry that together with the idea of a network society that kind of came about um, really uh, predominantly by Jan van Dijk, um, in the 1990s, uh, which came out of the whole individualism and, uh, and kind of the internet and that network society, then we start to see that we can, I mean, you know, Doina talks a lot about relational and has been do as an expert in all that, but that's where this comes from, that kind of idea of a network society and how we can have a series of nodes of commons that are then um, designed through a systems design into a larger kind of uh, organizational institutional form uh, that might create possibly the idea of a common sector. So then the commons are forms of carefully designed practices based on collective care and uh, produ who produce common good. They're embedded in concrete neighborhoods. And again, I quite like neighborhoods because they are smaller in scale, let's say around 20,000 inhabitants. And, um, and if you kind of look at what Christopher Alexander was saying uh, in his pattern language, book he talks about the idea what, that you start to have voicelessness in in cities when they go beyond five to ten thousand inhabitants so so that i think becomes quite interesting uh, uh talking about neighborhoods rather than uh kind of larger cities uh, in in terms of what um i've been doing in terms of cultural commons not not um not that that is interesting <laughs> overall but um but it's kind of quite nice to think about these scales um going up to the urban commons um okay i've said that already so i won't um so this is what I just mentioned earlier, shifting aesthetic discussion from things to forms of organization. Um, again, John Holloway, um, one of my favorite <laughs> um, scholars at the moment, uh, who talks about doing um, rather than laboring. Um, and, and he talks about, and one of the reasons why I, I have to agree with him that we can't just replace the markets with the commons, is that he says by replacing something which is so ingrained in its logic to top-down power by another form which isn't about top-down power, you, in, it, you instantly make it something that, that starts to uh, occupy that that logic of power. So, and that's what he critiques how communism failed because it started to, to want to replace monarchy of a top-down power with a system which wasn't supposed to be one, but it had to be in order to keep power then to be uh, non-hierarchical, which just never works. So that is quite interesting. 
Um, and so, so design, um, so I became quite interested in thinking widely about design um, as, uh, as part of critical practice um, and uh, ethical inquiry. So action-centric design intervention, which I think could be termed in terms of temporary architecture, installations in art or design intervention in design can all be uh, forms of inquiry where I think a lot of us are actually using that also in the urban commons research group where we act, we do something and then we uh, we analyze it and reflect on it and, and so on and so forth. Um, so claiming back also user experience in the design field has been quite um, it's it's quite commercial um, and about you know your user experience in the shop, but actually, what does it mean when we talk about user experience in events, uh, in community events or community festivals, um, designing relationships, um, and that might sound really scary, um, but actually, when it's it's more about designing events and social engagement settings, if you like, uh, by thinking about the kind of caring relationships we want to set up and that's how we then design those events. Um, and that's where these kind of beautiful organizing comes in because if they're embedded in care, then they, if beauty is termed as something that gives you joy and happiness, um, which um, then, then if we're if we're designing structures and institutions with that in mind, then uh, then that becomes a form of aesthetic in that sense. Uh, systems design, which we've talked about, uh, institutional design is another design uh, field, and transformation design, which I don't know huge amounts ab about it, but it, it's kind of much more about complex thinking. So it kind of goes into systems design. I don't know how time is. I, I was going to just have a few slides just to talk about the project, but if I if we're running out of time, I can just leave that. Bit richer. Um, yeah, you talked for about twenty minutes. I think it would be useful to talk a bit about the projects and. Okay. Okay. So but I'll whiz through it. it. Yeah. Okay. So um, so really quickly. Okay, I'll look at my clock. So this is the this is actually was initiated through London Metropolitan University as a as my research project um, in this in in my undergraduate well not my I was teaching with others under um, the undergraduate studio it started like that um, in the Roman Road and um, and it really kind of aligns with what we were doing in public works around how do we start to deal with uh, grabbing public land through architecture and events. And so the design intervention I was talking about in this situation was this temporary architecture as a disobedient object in a way, but yet stealth and legal and obedient. So I kind of quite like uh, and um, Daniel Miller talks about, you know, uh, when you're making change and nobody can actually see that that um, can actually detect it as something disobedient. That's where it's at its most dangerous. And so I kind of uh, quite like this kind of stealth disobedience. Um, I think another thing, which is again with the same project, um, so that site was this, I don't know if you can see my arrow, but it's in the in this area which is a bit black. And um, at the same time, as we were occupying that space um, and running lots of community events and getting the community to use it as a public living room, um, we, um, we had an experience in Hackney Wick that um, they were losing land right, left and center, and they had been told by the authorities not to do a neighborhood plan. So I convinced the local community to actually start one. And I find neighborhood planning, re I know that it's part of the neoliberal localism and all of that, but again, as a, as a crack, um, and a loophole, I find it really interesting as a way to construct urban commons. Um, and I, can't, I don't have enough time to go through it, but I just wanted to say in terms of the scale of the neighborhood, I think this uh, is a really interesting vehicle and a tool. Um, 
And in terms of the um, this again, design intervention as a form of inquiry. So, so this kind of doing this intervention and lots of multiple kind of different forms of um, paintings, posters, furniture, comics, or events, you test. Um, you know, you create no new social relationships. Some people decide to never engage again. Some people continue to engage and you build that over time. And we've, I've been there for seven years now. So over these seven years, you deepen these relationships. And all of those, um, as you see, these blue and white circles are these events, interventions, loops that then end up to uh, being a kind of um, organizational form that one could then think of as a sustainable commons commons organization that could then sustain um, that relate you know those uh, assets or sites. So so this site just really quickly um, we have managed to claim now for 25 years um, from the local housing association for the Roman Road Trust, a local uh, community group who I've been basically working with throughout this time and with other communities to take over. And uh, let's just move quickly to this. And this is kind of doing these feasibility studies that architects do. We basically documented and evidenced all of these activities over time. Um, and those activities documented in these uh, documents basically was one of the main reasons why we could evidence the social worth of the site and, and claim the site. Um, we have now... Um, got uh, funding from the GLA uh, as a crowdfund to really build this as a permanent project and a permanent building. So in a way, this move to make the temporary into the permanent uh, means that we've solidified now this common good for at least 25 years and God knows what happens after that uh, as a common good within that neighborhood. So it's kind of really about this process of building common good uh, in neighborhoods it, it slowly. Um, and just going back to this slowly, um, I think events become a really important part of mobilizing the commons, designing experience, that socialization that we were talking about in building new imaginaries, um, designing events for transformation, not as a spectacle, and building trust and commitment, which means really staying there and being there over all that kind of period of time to build relationships uh, over time. Um, and I think I leave it there, actually, so we have time to um, time to have a discussion. Sorry if I whizzed through that and it was a bit... No, thank you very much, Taj. Again, apologies, we, we took a bit longer, so hope you didn't feel you at the rush. Uh, we're happy now to take comments and questions, uh, maybe comments from across the two, the two presentations, but also from everyone attending. And feel free to either, you can raise your hand uh, if you have ever used Microsoft Teams before. It's on the top menu and I'll be looking at that. And also if you prefer to type a question in the chat, uh, we can, we'll keep an eye and I can read them out. Yes, Josie. Hello. Um, so I, I got, was fascinated about an article. Um, I'm from, um, I was in the university in California and there's a lot of homelessness in California and there's a lot of grassroots like activism going on. And I think like with the cultural commons, uh, what I get really excited about is the fact that it is these smaller communities and it is the best way to possibly disrupt um and reorganize and create safety for people and there was an article just this week in the guardian about the cob houses being uh, built under the freeway overpasses in oakland i don't know if you happen to see that but um you know there's sort of these re like even i mean even here in london during the uh quarantine there's been like this repositioning of land 
where people are creating community gardens in places where there used to be piles of rubbish and so forth. And um, I guess I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's so much of a question as much as it's just like a comment, but, um, you know, especially when it comes to houselessness or homelessness and, and, and people just taking up spaces that they can in order to survive and have their food and, and their well-being and take care of each other. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how to pose that as a question. I just feel really excited about it. And I, and I'm really appreciating all of your work and, um, yep, that's all, I guess. So, thanks. Thank you. I can maybe take a couple more comments and then see if there are any reactions from, uh, Taranger, from the group. Uh, Anna, uh, uh, the, not you, Anna Mendes. There's a, Anna with the hand raised. It's me? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's me. I have to. Oh, was it you? Oh, okay. It's me, it's me. Yeah. No, I just wanted to thank Torrance for, you know, like throwing this, like, really interesting, you know, array of actually opening, you know, like to also new perspective on the cultural commons. But I was curious on your, like, question mark on the open source. Because in the tradition of actually uh, culture and the copyleft, which will be, you know, the cultural reaction to the copyright, um, open source is like one of the examples. And, and it has been always like the one source of um, references for, for any kind of immaterial comment. So I was just curious why, why you think, mm, maybe not. Um, so I... Because I've been thinking about it quite a lot because whenever I present things to, for example, local authorities, they, there is this real confusion between what's open to all and public um, and what is common. So, so then what it does, it starts to, uh, they start to say, well, you know, we're doing it anyway, you know. Um, and so, so there, I, I think there is a real... For me, the open source is very open and public to all, um, and it's a public good, in 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 my opinion, uh, uh, which is doesn't have. Whereas the Commons has, I mean, when Ostrom says Commons have a boundary and a defined enclosure, if you like, but so it becomes about how you design those boundaries. But I kind of believe in that. You know, I have a bit of a problem with it on the one hand because you could, you have to be careful it doesn't become an enclosure again and exclusive. So you have to design the boundary. That actually then the, the the key thing becomes about the designing of the boundaries, not to be exclusionary. Um, but on the other hand, if it's just open to all and universal and abstract, then you don't have the arena to actually really build those relationships you know, really close relationships of care and respect and familiarity and all of those things who those of us who work really close, you know, they're, they're quite emotional, no? So so that I, I'm, I'm quite interested in that also feminist aspect of the commons with being also arenas for for emotions and not just rationality um so 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 the the open source i i also don't know enough about it so it just came up at um at a talk uh with the design council where they were saying is this just uh, a kind of uh open source regime or a pub you know uh, open public regime or is it a commons so it was also so there was quite a debate around it and i do think in the literature there is a lot of confusion between these things at the moment but but that's fine you know we're, we're trying to articulate these things and i might be totally wrong but I, it's just it's i don't have a i'm not saying it is or it isn't <laughs> but i just pose it as a question that if so for example is a, a park uh, so we have, uh, and Doina knows it very well, it was actually inspired by Ecobox. We have um, Abbey Gardens, uh, a kind of community garden, which is a community garden, but it's also a public park. 
So I've been kind of thinking that actually the community bit, which we are part of, the friends of our charity, the friends of Abbey Gardens, we're a commons because we have a WhatsApp group, we're a community, we care for each other and all of that. But the park, which is open to everyone, anybody could come in, anybody could sit, anybody, you know, that's a public resource, it's a public good. And of course, these, when they clash, um, they have a lot of conflicts, you know, so because their people take the food and then the, pe the the community get upset and, you know, so so they start to. And I find that really quite interesting, like how these these different logics um, interact. So I shut up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have Ollie next. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Oh, good, good, good. Um, thank you for some excellent talks. Uh, it's, I'm looking forward to reading the handbook. It's, it's, I'm assuming you, you said it was being ready. Is it out yet? Is it? It's it's in process. <laughs> yeah. okay, okay. No, that'd be great. Well, if you could let us know, that, that'd be awesome. Um, just, I mean, it kind of follows on from what was just um, what you were just saying, really, because it strikes me that uh, what's really important here is to differentiate between the public and the commons quite specifically because I, I would I would kind of try and push back a little bit on the kind of argue the argument that the commons needs a boundary because it kind of you're absolutely right to say well you know you've got to be very careful and then you kind of fall into a little bit of a stewardship role to say well look, there are some people who are de deemed worthy to decide where those boundaries are and you know who don't and I think that's one of the issues that Aust Ostrom's work kind of brings to the fore is that often you know you, it's all very well meaning and everything but often there's a sort of assumed role that it's often the west imperial powers who are th the ones with enough knowledge to decide that the amazon rainforest for example should be looked after by the un and not by the indigenous communities so i think there's a certain element of um care that's been needed but uh, and you know and to, to uh, my question really is about what you were saying with regards to the to it to the commons existing alongside the markets, some of John Holloway's stuff. I mean, my my point is is that what what where's the check then against capitalist markets always looking to enclose the commons because the commons cannot by def well by definition depending on which definition you're using I guess but. You know, the, the, the very definition of capitalism is that it's constant desire to claim that which is common or that which is not yet private. So I have a real, I'm very kind of concerned that if you try to build a society which says, oh, the commons can exist alongside the, the, the markets, the markets will inevitably conquer the commons because that's just what it does. So I'm just wondering in what institutions do we need to build in order to try and make that existence happen where that co-option doesn't happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that's to me because I said that. <laughs> but um, I, I, I'll just try and be really quick about it. I think what Kate Raworth talks about um, where she says that the markets have to be absolutely controlled um and so so she i mean i i can't talk about all the stuff that she talks about in terms of how they should be controlled and all the mechanisms for their control but i suppose what she also says is that we've always had markets you know whether they're they're kind of your market in the middle of, not in this system that this not in this form um i'm not talking about this neoliberal form of the market but you know you've had markets in in the middle of the towns right you've always had had trade and retail um, so it's not that we've ne you know we haven't had it it's now the form that it is right now it is in its worst because it dominates everything and it's a hegemony um, but actually if you you have to also redesign that system it's not it's not so I suppose for me it's not about so what happens if the commons have to trade then you'll end up with the same issues because and and how are you going to do that you know so um and and then it becomes a bit of a bit of an ideological uh kind of the, the, the hegemony just shifts so so i so i think it's really about quite a careful 
design process of, of what these things do, what their logics are, and how does one address those. And also uh, the boundary. So I give you an example, Public Works as an organization, we kind of have been really thinking about ourselves as a commons. It's not a free for all what we produce, you know. Um, we do have a boundary of members who are within it, but we have to design what that boundary is to our collaborators, to, you know, how do people, what do the, what intellectual property are they allowed to have? Are they not allowed to have? So so I I, I think I think these kind of slightly universal idea of what's bad and what's good I, that's what I'm critiquing that I think we need to be a little bit nuanced in what those things really mean and um, because otherwise we'll do it without thinking that they are the boundaries and then we just do it because that's the way it is I mean it's not like you know we ha you have if you have an organization you give your your you know your your IP over to everybody to use it in any way they want and if, and so so i do think there are that those things exist and just by ideologically saying it shouldn't exist i i have a problem with that because i think we just ignore them thank you were there any further reactions to this comment um, yeah, I, I wanted to add a little bit of uh, complexity here because I think um, uh, I'm, I'm a bit um, uncomfortable with this polarity between common and public, um, which uh, plays the thinking of and the understanding of, of the commons uh, within the realm of property. And I, I, I think, you know, and I agree with those um you know uh, thinkers and theorists and practitioners that are rather thinking the commons through um, relationality and um you know in terms of relations uh, and in terms of um uh, of um thinking about uh, uh about them outside this notion of property as as not something that uh, even sits between public and private, but can sit within any of them. And uh, I, I like a lot this idea of, of boundary and, uh, you know, Stavide speak, speaks about threshold and I think the threshold also, uh, it's an interesting notion to think about commons as, as thresholds or as, uh, as generating thresholds. And, and, and I definitely think that is important as designer to design <laughs> Uh, these thresholds to think uh, at the all the complexity uh, to design institutions that are acting as thresholds and also i think that we have to think about all this as uh, as in transition as performative as something that uh, has to uh, happen again and again i mean it's it's uh, it's a continual process it's not something that you can let's say uh, set up a boundary and this is it. It has to. Co it is a process, um, and uh, yeah, I, I just uh, think that uh, you know the, the commons and thinking about commons can help us also to completely uh, look in a different way, uh, uh, also at how we perceive markets, how we per how, how we perceive. Uh, uh, public, uh, this notion of public goods, common goods, um, it's, pro it's probably um, um, a different way of framing the discussion. Thank you. Uh, Nick, did you want to comment as well? Yeah, I just I just wanted to say just a, a kind of extension, really, of uh, Taraj's or just the discussion between uh, Taraj and Doina actually around this relationship between the public realm and uh, and the commons, because I'm, I'm, I'm equally uncomfortable about about the sort of division or at least not a division, but a kind of tacit separation between the two, because I think it's really problematic. Um, I mean, it reminds me a little bit of I mean, that the problem actually was was confronted by Saint Augustine in the City of God, actually, when he talked about the relationship between the city, which is the place of the masses, 
and he talked about the idea of community, civiltatis, which is the idea of the of the the group of people within the believers, if you like, who are part of the city. Uh, one is the the physical fabric, if you like, the institutions, the structures, and the other one are, uh, are individuals, peoples come together with a common good, with a common interest. So it's it's not a new it's not a new problem. It's one that's been tackled in you know since antiquity. But the thing that that I, I think is a real problem here actually is where do we deal with conflict in the context of the commons? And it seems to me a really important question. Um, cities places have always dealt with in different ways, whether through ceremony, through rituals through different kinds of events in formal and sometimes informal ways of this issue of contest and conflict. The, the notion of the agonic is fundamental to the life of, of, of cities. And it seems to me that there is something um, missing in the debates around the idea of the commons. And it may be it's because of this tacit separation between the commons and the public realm. And the thing that seems to me to be really missing in that relationship is what I consider to be fundamental. In fact, I consider it to be the hinge point here, and that is the civic ground, the common ground that we call the civic life. And you kind of think, well, where does the civic lie? Is it in the commons or is it in the public realm? And if it's in the public realm, then is there no civic life in the commons? And that's, to me, that's a really important question. Uh, it's in the civic that we deal with conflict, by the way, uh, the history of cities is actually how conflict is managed through different kinds of events, uh, whether it's about contests, think of football, you know, football deals with conflict or a contest through through rivalries. Um, but so that question, I think, is a really important one. Uh, it's an architectural question as well as a social cultural one. Can I just say something? I think maybe there's a misunderstanding. I mean, I, it's not that they're completely separated. It's more that their logics are, are slightly different. It's not that they are separated from each other, um, but that they actually, so, so when you have, for example, the community garden, the, what the, um, the logics of what that public space is about is quite different to the logic of 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 the, the community garden which is on it because of the way it has been structured in terms of what is our public land or public space or who's and not not just about its management but the way it's all conceived of so I don't think I, I it's it's more that I mean, I talk about the civic commons as where these things come together, the, um, you know, the, the, the common and the public. But at the moment, what is happening, um, and this is just from experience, is that the, the, the public sector, if you like, what we call the public, they do things to the public, and uh, whether it's services or wh whatever it is, um, and and that kind of and they call that whole arena public and that is really important. We have to protect it. We have to protect, you know, the the public health and and the public spaces and all of that. But the but the common the common good um, is produced. It has a different logic. It's produced from the bottom up, and it deals with much more particularity and much more specificity of things which are in local areas. And they don't sometimes marry, you know, the, the, the politics sometimes doesn't marry with, with this. And what, what brings them together, the commons, I think, have the potential to start to negotiate these relationships, which they haven't been doing. You know, that's why you have all these kind of people saying, I, politics doesn't do anything for me, so I'm not going to go and vote. You know, I mean, I, I, we've been hearing them on the streets. We've been hearing them for 20 years from people saying those things, that they there isn't a marrying up of those things. So, so when I, I'm not saying that they need to not be together. So maybe that diagram is slightly misleading. It's more that that we we have to kind of think that they are they do have a slightly different logic in the way they're conceptualized. So I, I don't know. I mean, maybe then even if that's uh, kind of problematic, then we should. Yeah, it would be nice. 
I'd like to give the floor to Gabo because I'm has been waiting for some time. Hey everyone, great to see you. It's great really been a pleasure you. to listen. Do you hear me? Yeah, yes. it's been a pleasure to listen to you and to actually see this um, uh, teaming up of uh, universities and research projects. Um, actually, much has been said. I wanted to also bring in conflict, really, um, as this uh, dimension, which actually, by definition, connects commons to the public. I mean, there's something about, um, like, uh, in antagonistic theories that describe very clearly that uh, in the private realm, we may be having, like, uh, I don't know, we may be fighting with a family member, but that's not the term of the type of conflict that actually link, describes what public space is about or publicness is about. So commons, and and it was exactly when you described um, the, the the clash of like with the public uh, with the publicness of a of um, an urban garden. This is when when it absolutely comes together. And I'm also slightly I feel slightly unpleasant to consider the 100% bottom-up and the other 100% uh, top-down, I do not believe that. It's impossible to have only top-bottom-up and it's impossible to only have top-down structures. Top-down top structures are supported by bottom-up agreement or disagreement or quietness, and bottom-up structures are supported by the possibilities of even being there. An urban garden wouldn't be there if politics wouldn't have still maintained this garden to be able to be taken. So. I think it's totally important to rather conceptualize how um, it is the conflict. Um, uh, maybe when somebody mentioned like this, um, the problem with the markets or like the problem with neoliberal markets, it is if commons would actually be in conflict and outspokenly with what they don't agree with. I think this is exactly where we also, it also necessarily becomes by definition a public issue. And the public engagement, and um, and I'm obviously like um, in favor of of the public, and that's uh, like we need the private realm. But what we really, what we really need to kind of fight for is uh, publicness, and um, and I also like the notion of boundaries, absolutely. And this is of course also what Hannah Arendt clearly describes as as an important need for publicness. So anyway, just wanted to say hello from Vienna, and maybe Vienna is the place that that's why I. I do strongly believe in that there's a possibility of um, thinking, I don't even know if we would call it top down, bottom up or politics, popular agency together in different forms and notions um, and in and serving and maybe maybe different versions of publicness. So did I ask a question? Uh, maybe Beatrice, <laughs> Beatrice, you can frame this into a question. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll actually take the last two comments from Ms. and then Kai, and maybe I'll take them both in a row, and then we can have a last round of uh, comments or reactions from the speakers. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much for your talks. Um, I have a sort of a comment and then a question about a um, question about urban commons. Um, I think we heard a lot like reference to Ostrom in the talk and Ostrom's work was enormously helpful in debunking the myth of the tragedy of the commons. Um, and she was able to do that through like very, very uh, detailed case studies. Uh, and those case studies were all about natural resources, common and common pool resources. So David Harvey argues that you know, while Ostrom's work was enormously helpful in kind of imagining the potential of, of commons in urban context, that um, her principle of um, kind of long lasting, or principles of design of long lasting commons pool resources cannot be directly transferred into urban context because just the urban environment is just in, saturated with all kinds of relationships between people, property rights, different kinds of sites, and so on. Um, so my question here um, is, and I'm kind of drawing this from my own um, experience, like doing research on um, appropriation of public space, more specifically alleys, back alleys. So for my cases, which were in Melbourne, Australia, um, what I studied was like really informal, not council sanctioned, approved, or even known appropriation of lanes into all kinds of things, including um, gardens as well. And it really worked very, very well for the residents and even for some people like outsiders. Um, but at the same time, or like more recently that I noticed, they are kind of council funded 
uh, initiated, um, sometimes professional um, architects supported similar kinds of things. So in residential alleys, for example. So it sort of like looks the same, but is it? So I guess my question here, like when we look at the urban environment and all the relationships that are happening, like, is it something that really truly happens like from bottom up? And I'm really, I'm asking no one in particular here because I think it's just like very generic question. Um, like when we have a situation where something happens like so organically and bottom up, and it could to some extent maybe be even illegal. And if it looks very similar to something that is um, council commissioned and architect produced, is it the same thing? And what is the role of architect in all of this, all of all this process? Thank you, Mitzi. And I'd maybe take the last comment or question from Kai, and then um, if anyone in the group wants to respond. I got you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so um, thank you so much for the lecture. It's very informative and inspiring. Um, I'm a master student doing landscape architecture in the Ballet School of Architecture at UCL, and I'm currently working on a thesis investigating a way to design an urban foil while prevent generating the phenomenon of green gentrification that usually caused by the um, contemporary landscape development, such as you know um, the New York Highlight Park that always being blamed as a greenwash project that eventually displacing the community led by the development. And um, many people are suggesting that tactical urbanism and um, bottom up design could be a way to um, design a space while uh, won't causing negative um, phenomena like gentrification. So how do you think our urban framework, because like our urban um, framework is a bottom up framework, how do you think our urban could be used as a tool by designers and architects to prevent, uh, prevent causing the gentrification phenomenon while they de while they're designing a space. And what do you what do you think is the main mechanism that allows our urban framework to do so? Thank you. Okay, so can I call for the last few comments from I know Anna, you had your hand raised. I don't know if you want to also respond to this last couple of questions. Or not, <laughs> but let's say we are moving towards wrapping up. Uh, no, I was just saying that that I think that the 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 whole question of of the of the public and the commons is is crucial here. But um, in that respect, I like the Elizabeth Blackmar uh, distinction between the the public and the commons and the private and even if it's from a legalistic, let's say, uh, point of view. But what she actually was saying is like, the public, how the public manages a certain kind of common good of resources, actually, it's based on a restriction of the access to that public good. Um, the same as the private, but in the name of, a, let's say, wider constituency. And that is the difference with the commons where nobody from the community can actually be excluded. And I think it is interesting then from the commons, the, the comments that have been done, how this access is not only access to the to, to use the common good, but then access to the decisions over that common good, but access also to the possibility of having meaningful, uh, you know, like bonding and engagement relations there. And so I think that when, when we, Say the public is the same as the commons, or 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 you know, or the they say the, the 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 more global public as a kind of commons that has no limits and has no community attached. I think that we are now taking into consideration what is the role of the state as the person as as the as the say the institution that can actually determine who has access to that public good. So it it seems like okay, a park is open to everybody, and it is open to everybody until. You know, the state decides to close it. And when the state decides to close it, there is no mechanism and no way for everybody to reverse that decision if it's not through conflict. I mean, you can organize a social movement that actually puts this decision in conflict, but you can also do the same with the private. So actually, when you are in conflict, it's with someone that has taken the decision from you. And, and you know, like and then not fulfilling one, you know, like this democratic basic uh, characteristic of the commons that we actually mentioned at the beginning. 
And I think that this is a way to establish those boundaries and to also create uh, processes of politicization in relation with the commons that produce commons. But there is also a kind of an internal conflict that is also interesting. And I am, uh, yeah, curious that someone says like nobody has studied conflicts in relation with the commons because actually, actually Tina de Moore, which is the, the actual president of the International Association for the Study of the Commons after uh, Ostrom, has a whole line of research of how conflicts inside the commons actually are the mechanism that allow commons to uh, adapt and actually can help add one of the characteristics that help commons to actually maintain in time. So I think that we, we are a little bit, you know, like it's, it's, it's not really that conflict is not at the core. I think that conflict since Mars, you know, like to find it the, the, the enclosures uh, in relation to the, to the, um, to the uh, primitive accumulation on the one hand, and also actually the study of traditional commons take uh, conflict quite quite into into consideration um, and just one last thing but this is something that we, we have been a little bit working from my side is on the bottom of, uh, and the and the top down and also how Gabby was describing it and I think to which degree we are talking as a kind of a structures because when I think of what uh, top down I think again of the state you know and this kind of institutions from the state but there are other kinds of of structures you know institutional structures that may be a little bit more macro and then bottom up then we go to this neighborhood scale and the smallest scale of the actually the size even of the community that you can deal with which is much smaller and there uh, we actually reclaim in this uh, common codes collective the idea of the meso level and the role of the commons as as and the need of the commons to go you know, more or to at least articulate these smaller scales and not to then become the state, no? as Holloway was saying, but actually to become something else that then could uh, mediate on this intermediary scale. And then how, how, how do we call this? If the public is, you know, like the wide and, and the commons is a, is a small time. Thank you, Anna. Dange or... Diana or anyone else, if you want to maybe have a final comment or response. Mm. I, I would like to address this question about uh, the difference between the, let's say, informal commons, commons and, uh, and the designed commons, and, and maybe uh, about the role of the designers uh, and, and the potential danger in contributing to gentrification. Uh, I think this was the last, uh, if I well understood, concern that has been uh, raised. And I, I think uh, they are uh, both valid as, as long as the design commons uh, are uh, designed carefully, <laughs> with care, uh, I would say, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, respecting uh, the principles of commons. Um, and that, which means that uh, the designer uh, should be very aware of uh, of his or her role of uh, being perhaps a facilitator of uh, for the commons to emerge, or being part of uh, as a commoner uh, himself or herself uh, of of uh, of the of the whole common of of the commoning. Um, community and I, I think it was certainly the case of uh, us uh, as uh, AA this is uh, you know what what we are presenting <laughs> also in the book of urban commons as as a commons uh, is um, is a design driven somehow process of uh, of, uh, uh, of facilitating the emergence of urban commons in uh, in this case, in a, in a number of neighborhoods, um, with um, using our skills uh, and 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 thinking about design as a commoning activity itself, um, and uh, but we we did it with a lot of care of not um, bringing in or designing. Uh, um, 
you know, uh, elements uh, that would then uh, be um, a contribute to the change uh, of, of the nature of the common. Um, so, so they would rather empower uh, the, um, those that have chosen to participate in the common, that would have chosen to be part of the, to be commoners, uh, to, to stay there and to, uh, you know, to have a, a, an important role in the governance of the common, in, um, to, to take over, because uh, at a certain moment we are uh, leaving um, the common, but uh, we, we can help it to, we can continue to design its boundary. We can help it to remain open, to connect with others, to be part of networks. So, uh, and, and it's, it's definitely uh, an issue of, uh, you know, of, of being aware of, uh, of, of your position. Um, and, and, and perhaps not all, uh, so, you know, designers would do like this, uh, perhaps not all design commons would, would be real commons. Um, and and, and we, we need to make, uh, to, to learn how to make the distinction between these two, to, to, and to make the difference and to remain continually critical uh, of our own position. Thank you. I think just one little thing that I think this whole co-option and how good a commons is, is really about having a critical reflective practice. Because if you're continuously criti being critical and reflective on your actions and how you're designing something, testing it all the time, which is, I suppose, how we have managed to not <laughs> uh, you know, operate in these kind of uh, arenas and, and make sure that it hasn't got caught. Then, then I think as a form of practice that in, in a neoliberal context, that's how you can do it. And I think just Anna, I think these little, for me, the smaller commons, when they are networked together, when they're aware of each other, they can fight the enclosure of the public spaces. And that's how we've done it here because that, because there were so many big number of community organizations that we all knew and we had created festivals together and and there was such a conviviality when there was a site that was going to be privatized we were the only you know the only area within Stratford that could actually um, resist it and so that's where that conflict kind of comes in but uh, but I, th I do think if they're networked, uh, the smaller commons, but you, you, you need, yeah, I, I still think that there is a, I still think there is a real distinction because the public space in a neoliberal context where the, where the public space itself is so imbued with neoliberal ideas because the, the state and the market are so muddied together, then, um, then you do need the commons and the, and the, and these political communities to to um, to kind of keep these both accountable. There is no accountability, I think, and I and that's where I think the political role of the commons in neoliberal um, countries are. That's my last words. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tange. I'm very sorry I need to bring this to a close. It's been a Really fascinating and for me also personally very exciting to bring together the, this these different conversations so thank you every, very much to everyone for contributing and i think we've had proof that we need more spaces to discuss these ideas uh, thank you thanks a lot thank you thank you bye bye